got an Akai GX365 brought in just to have the levels checked on it and set. This is one that I had about a year or so go in for some repair work and um, they just want it double checked and the record levels calibrated on it so the record levels are a little bit low uh, when they make the recording. So we're going to hook it up to the, uh, the tone generator and just calibrate everything according to the manual. So let's uh, get started. I've got an Akai. This is a 365D auto reverse, reel to reel obviously, that has been brought in for the record amplifier adjustment, record level adjustment to be performed. So these units you have to kind of service them on their side because you can't really set them once you remove it from the cabinet, you can't really set it on uh, upright because one, you need to be able to get out the adjustments on the bottom here, but two, and I'm having to carefully rotate this thing as to not scratch it, is that you don't want to put any weight on this bottom bracket, which sticks out below the, the, the base. Normally it fits in the cabinet because if you set it upright, the pressure on here will fracture these circuit boards. And that's happened, I think, on this one. Yeah, this board has been repaired once. I had this unit a while back, and I had to repair the board because the owner somehow cracked the board when they were taking it apart themselves to work on it. So I've got a couple of adjustments to make on this. We're going to hook it up to the uh, audio oscillator and uh, set it up and uh, we'll, we'll make the appropriate adjustments to the record uh, level controls. What's happening right now is a recording level of 0 dB on the meter on record is not coming back at 0, it's coming back at about minus 6 on playback at seven and a half using the large capstan which of course has the three and three quarter position switch pressed on the front using the large capstan adapter because this machine here out of the box with the without the capstan adapter was one and seven eighths three and three quarters and seven and a half and with the the capstan shaft adapter on it was uh, three and three quarter seven and a half and fifteen IPS you can see this is where the, the capstan adapter would live right down here if you weren't using it and there's a second pinch roller too as well for using the smaller capstan shaft and then a different pinch roller for using the larger capstan shaft which just comes off by unscrewing it but we're going to leave that on and we're going to do the settings uh, adjustments at seven and a half IPS Okay, on these units, the boards that are of interest are, this is the playback amplifier board, this one, and these are the record boards, one for the left channel, one for the right channel. So we're going to be adjusting these controls here. So the first thing I do is I put the thing into record mode and get my tone recording. I'll set my record levels up to get the playback at 0 dB and I'm going to set the two controls so that the meter reads zero. I'll show you what the meter shows. I was gonna, I just, I did the adjustments. I'll show you what the adjustments do. Maybe I can turn that down a bit. That tone, it's kind of loud. So what these do is these are calibrating the meters for, for, um, for the recording session. So to set this up, you, you have the unit in record mode, have your tape monitor and tape and set your recording level so that you have zero dB. It's fluctuating slightly because the tape itself has got some dropouts, obviously. Switch back to source and then adjust the two controls accordingly so that you are sitting right on zero dB. Now the tape and source shows the same. 0 dB, 0 dB.
levels are now set. Now we can record some music on it and see how it sounds, see how the levels come back. To put these things back together, you kind of have to tilt them onto their... You don't ever let the, the, the unit sit flush. As I say, those boards can get damaged. So you kind of have to balance it like this on the front as you slide the back onto them, slide the cabinet in. And once the cabinet gets in far enough, it will it will ride on the rails on the side. There's there's two there's two wooden rails down on the base there that uh, it will slide in on. That holds the chassis up. So once you get the cabinet in place, it'll just slide in like that. screws go in the back and the base and then we can test this unit make some recordings on it and see how it sounds these units generally sound pretty good I'm a fan of Akai and Sony reel-to-reel uh, -reel. I've got a couple of them myself People would think that I'm a real, a real to real fan, but to tell you the truth, I rarely ever use them. I have a nice TAC four channel unit sitting in my living room, and it's basically just a display piece. I haven't used the thing in uh, in years. I actually have to keep the tape. I have to keep the tape attached to the reel itself with a piece of tape over it because my cat likes to eat the tape and he'll if I have it threaded up and I'm not actually listening to it if I stop it for example the cat will come along and chew the tape and break the tape and then eat the tape so I can't even use the machine I have a cat that's got a fetish with plastic and he likes to eat anything that's plastic it's gonna kill the cat one of these days I swear to God but the cat likes to eat plastic. Four more large screws in the bottom that hold this thing together. And that's all it is. There's four in the back, the two bottom feet and two screws above it. And then these four that go in down here. Somehow they go in. There we go, that one's threading in. And that's what holds these units together. Now in doing these level adjustments, you need to use a reference type tape. Because different tapes will have different characteristics. So I set it up on one tape. If the owner of the unit uses a different brand of tape, the results are going to vary, of course. This is what I've been using for setup. It's Ampex Type 541. This is um, industry standard reference tape that uh, all the manufacturers recommend using. It was the de facto standard used in recording studios back in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. Very popular, very stable tape. It's, a, it's just a standard ferric oxide tape, but it is a very good quality iron oxide tape that is very stable and is used as a reference for all the manufacturers use that one as a reference. That's what I've been using for my testing with here. It's old stock. I've got a box of it, a brand new box of old stock of those tapes. Got about, I think it was 12 tapes in it. And they're still factory sealed. I've, I've, opened, a, I've opened a couple of them, but the majority of them are still factory sealed. Okay, let's start a recording session. Have a little MP3 player queued up here. We'll check our levels. This track takes a second to start, I think. There we go. So let's uh, do our recording and see how this thing sounds. I'll put it on. Uh, I'll put it on playback here, so you can hear it playing back off the tape itself. When we look at the levels going in and coming back, our levels are the same. So there's our source, and there's our playback.
Sounding great. I've got a couple of other tapes that were given to me recently, and I, I just had to bring this up because I thought this was just too funny. A friend of mine gave me these ears from his father's collection. He said, yeah, they, 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 they had nothing on them or they didn't have very good sound or, you know, what's wrong with this picture? The tapes are all, the tapes are spooled backwards. Can you believe it that somebody would actually try to record on the back side of a tape? This is a back coated tape. How you can tell the back side of the tape from the front side of the tape, incidentally, if you don't know, is because uh, some tapes are, are pretty shiny, is just give the end a bit of a tug. And if you stretch the tape, the oxide will actually come off on the side that is the recording side. In this case, it's spooled out. Okay, that's the quick, easy way to tell which side of the tape is the oxide when you've got a tape that looks the same a lot of these some of these higher end tapes from the 1970s looked pretty shiny on both sides they didn't have a shiny and a dull side let's uh, re-spool this tape and see if this one actually works now there's a reason I picked on this particular tape because I want to show you a phenomenon this is fast forward You notice how slow the tape is moving. That's because this back coated tape, a lot of it, was absolute garbage. The, the binder has penetrated through the tape coating. This is a tape that's known for the sticky shed syndrome. I don't think there's anything even recorded on this tape. But um, I think this is the virgin tape that's never been used. They had it spooled backwards. I'm just going to try and re-spool this thing and try making a recording on it, but uh, not having much luck here, am I? Of course, to spool it away from the heads, just have to hold up the auto stop lever. Now it'll go the proper speed. See, the reason it was going so slow over the heads is that it's actually the friction just going over, even though it's not actually hitting the heads, the tape is going over. There's a bar in here that pulls the tape back from the heads, but just going over that was slowing it down. We'll just re-spool this tape the correct way and then try to make a recording on it, but I know that that's not even going to work. But we'll try it just for, uh, how's the saying go? Bits and giggles? Because <laughs> this tape is no good. All these, a lot of these old tapes are just garbage. That's why I have to laugh when I see people with their reel-to-reels, how uh, they want to hang on to nostalgia. Well, the only problem is nostalgia is great, but uh, when you've got old tape, a lot of this old tape is crap. Some of it's still very good. Th those old Ampex tapes, for example, I've got, those are fantastic tapes. Any of the brown oxide tapes were typically pretty good. When it came to the, the fancy tapes, that's where we started having problems. And I have a couple of them here. Here's a Sony. I, I, I've never seen a Sony Ferrochrome recording tape. Of course, it's also spooled backwards, so we'll fix that one. We'll re-spool that one the right way as well. And uh, I'm gonna re-spool all these three tapes. We'll see how they're, if they actually work, whether I can make a recording on them. Again, the Sony is a back-coated tape, so we know this is going to be crap. And it's backwards because I was able to verify that the oxide is actually on the outside of the tape, not the, not the inside. So we're going we're gonna to this, give this a twist, put the oxide on the inside, fast forward it to the end, and then rewind it all the way back. I love the warning that they put on this one too. Caution, recorded programs on this tape may not be completely erased on some recorders with insufficient erase capabilities for this tape. A Sony tape recorder equipped 
with tape selector switch for ferrochrome is highly recommended. Yep. Needed a little higher bias to erase it because they had a chromium dioxide coating as well as the ferric oxide. And that was a fantastic formulation back in the uh, days of cassette tapes. That was, I mean, that was great. They had the best sounding. There should be Greek music on this if there's anything on here. Um, but they had the best sounding uh, cassettes, short of a metal tape. They were fantastic. I've never seen a Sony ferrochrome reel-to-reel -reel tape before. Never. So this is the first for me. I can see how people made a mistake when they when they spooled them up. They got a twist in them because uh, with the uh, back coating, like I got a twist in here already without even trying. The back coating on them uh, when the tape was black and the back was also black made it uh, a little more of a challenge to see what way the tape was uh, being threaded on. Especially if you're threading it on in low light. Now the ones that were back coated and they had a brown coating on the front, uh, th those were no problem. Look what's come off the tape just I was using my holding my holding the tape up with my finger here slightly so it wasn't uh, making contact with this uh, the magnetic brake control and just the tape itself was coming apart on my just running over my finger I had my finger sitting right here and uh, the tape was actually coming off the or the I think it was probably the back coating was coming off of this tape so this is the biggest problem with this tape especially on these machines with glass heads. This tape will probably play fine if I played on my standard machine with standard metal uh, ferrite heads. But this has got the glass and ferrite crystal head as they call it. Take a listen. You don't even have to listen to the music. Just listen to the tape as it passes over the heads. I have not even started to play this yet. I've just threaded it up. That's the problem with uh, this back coated tape. All these tapes that have the sticky shed syndrome, and it won't even it won't even rewind on the machine. Look at that. Scotch branded VHS and Beta tapes were also back coated and suffered a similar fate as these audio tapes. This back coated tape was crap. That's how bad this tape was. When tapes get like this, some people will try to bake them. They'll put them. You want a food dehydrator or bake them on an oven for, you know, for a couple of hours, six hours or so at like 100 and 100, 100, what was it, 120 degrees or 140 degrees, somewhere in there. I have to look it up, but they would bake the tapes to try and take out the moisture that they've picked up. But uh, you, sometimes when you bake them, you can get one play out of them before they, uh, the tape itself is, uh, is bad. It won't play again. So this stuff's garbage. I mean, these tapes are, they were given to me and they're, they're going in the garbage. All these, all these tapes. I should drag out my non um, glass head machine and show that the tape actually will play on it. It's just that my non glass head machine is packed away right now. My Sony's, for example, they'll play on those. This is the ferrochrome tape. It's also, I think, gonna have sticky shed on this one because it's also a back coated tape. Mm, that one actually works. Not so That one actually works, although it is still pretty sticky. It wasn't as bad as the other one, but it's still. It's a back coat of tape. All this back coat of tape was junk. Let's try this uh, Ampex. This Ampex one apparently is blank. 
Never had anything recorded on it. So this tape, this tape here has never been used. Give this one a fighting chance. I'm going to clean the heads, even though they probably aren't dirty. Other than what was, uh, what contamination got on them from that, that few seconds I played that tape. I'm sure there's probably going to be a lot of contamination on here too. We're going to clean everything here. We got a little bit of contamination on here just from playing that tape for a few seconds. We'll thread this one up, see this being a blank tape, and uh, try making a recording on it and see how it, uh, how it performs or whether it does. It's also a back coated tape though, so chances are it's not going to work. It's going to uh, fail miserably just like the other ones did. Oh yeah, not even, I haven't even got into to make the recording yet. You can hear the actual tape squeaking as it's going past the heads. So it's going to be unusable. I say all this back coated tape is crap. What all these are good for is ripping the tape off the reels and getting some new tape. You buy it on a pancake, right? They don't come with reels. And you spool your own. That's about all these reels are good for is re-spooling the tape because at least this tape is no good. <laughs> it says it all right there. No good. This stuff's no good, so I'll clean the heads again before sending this thing out. But that gives you an idea what happens with the sticky shed stuff. And uh, maybe I'll drag out my non uh, my non glass head uh, machine, and we'll put that up, and just so you can see that these tapes probably probably will work on that one. And I'll get people upset with me for calling the glass head machines a piece of junk. But uh, they're not a piece of junk, but they're uh, certainly are more problematic when you're playing these tapes that are problematic. And a lot of them are from that era. Problematic. See, I just cleaned the heads, and that's what just came off of it after cleaning. I only played that for, what, uh, two minutes? 
two minutes and that, that oxide came off the off the tape onto the heads leave you here with the tape that came in with this machine this will bring back memories from anybody in the Vancouver area that used to listen to CFMI 101 everybody will remember this DJ happy Christmas war is over John Lennon and Yoko Ono with one of the most powerful of all modern Christmas songs next on this Christmas discumentary we continue our look at the more recent Christmas songs from Britain with music from the Kinks, Elton John, and much more. CFMI FM1, Vancouver. The shopping's done, the presents have been wrapped in anticipation of widely surprised eyes, and the smells of Christmas meals and treats waft through the house. There's nothing left to do but enjoy the good, warm feelings of family and friends during the festive season. The owners, operators, and employees of locally owned Super Value stores wish you and yours a safe, happy holiday and a prosperous new year. Please check your neighborhood Super Value for special holiday shopping hours. Super Value, our name is our promise. I'm Dave McCormick, and our Christmas discumentary continues with music from Rolling Stone, Keith Richards, and his version of Run, Rudolph, Run, first made famous by Chuck Berry back in 1958. Run, run, Rudolph! And that's about all I can play of that. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one real soon. I figured I'd put that little clip on there of Dave McCormick from his uh, radio days at CFMI. And then, of course, I've got a commercial play there for Super Value, which is a long gone uh, grocery store that was uh, operating in, in BC here. And they uh, shut down, I'm going to think it was back in the uh, the mid, mid 80s, I guess they shut down. And it was shut down, believe it or not, after the meat cutters went out on strike. And um, the meat cutters went out on strike. Picketed the store and no unionized workers would cross the picket line and shop there. And the store went bankrupt. The chain just disappeared. And uh, super value is no more. Anyway, um, thanks for watching. We'll catch you again in the next one real soon. Bye for now.